technical difficulties we just had. Uh, this is episode 23 of Turf Chat, uh, Soil Nutrition and Weed Management. And today we've got Scott McElroy from Auburn University and Michael Woods from the Asian Turfgrass Center. And then we're going to let the uh, people introduce themselves from uh, left to right on the bottom of the screen. And we'll start with the uh, presentations with Scott after we get done. I'm Larry Stoll from Pace Turf. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Chris. Chris Trudebaugh from Hazeltine National, and I actually, I'm, I've just got a call that I'm going to have to take, so I'm going to have to. <laughs> well, that's one down. Okay. <laughs> Whoops. We are muted. I think we got to turn your mute off. No sound now. How's that? There you go. Boy, this is getting complicated there. Uh, once again, Matthew Crowther, golf course superintendent, uh, Mink Commandos Golf Club, Martha's Vineyard. Here to help in any way I can. All right. It looks like we'll need it. <laughs> <laughs> I am Micah Woods. I'm the chief scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. And I'm Scott McElroy at Auburn University. Okay. I guess Scott, uh, why don't you? Uh, you have your presentation there. Why don't you? Well, I, I volunteer. I volunteer Micah first, since he sent out the first sent out that tweet about dandelions uh, control and kind of give it maybe give his thoughts on, on the matter. You know, he he kind of sparked some kind of re sparked some some interest, sparked some interest in me. So I, I'd let him start first. I think. Okay, I, I'll be happy to do that. I prepared. Uh, a little presentation so I will share my screen if that's all right so can you see that yes yeah. okay so these these are the the talking points that that I would like to discuss uh, there's three basically but the main thing is we should all be aware that the level of nutrients in the soil and the fertilizers that we apply to create different levels of nutrients in the soil will change what species grow they have an effect on what plant species grow and as a general rule when we put nitrogen fertilizer that's gonna favor grasses and at the park grass experiment which I'm going to introduce here it's pretty obvious that higher levels of soil pH, higher levels of calcium, phosphorus, and potassium in the soil allow what we would generally consider weeds like uh, clover or dandelion or plantain will grow more than they would in plots where those levels are lower. And Dr. Frank Rossi and I from Cornell University, we wrote an article about this in uh, this was published in April 2011 in the green section record and we we talked about some of the issues and showed some pictures there uh, based on some of the re results from the parkgrass experiment and if you don't know about the parkgrass experiment it is a long-term experiment that was started in 1856 so in 1856 that was before the Civil War, it was I think 157 years ago, and this is the manor at uh, at Rothamsted, and this experiment has been ongoing, as I said, for 157 years. And basically, what they do is they apply different fertilizers to all the plots, and then they harvest the grass for hay. The uh, the slides aren't advancing on our end. There we go. What slide are you at now? That's on the, the, the estate, but we didn't see your publication. There you go. <clears throat> so I'll do it like this. This should work good. So Dr. Rossi and I wrote this article. There's a picture of the dandelions. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear where there's potassium, there's lots of dandelions. Where they don't put potassium, there's no dandelions. So I'm not saying that this works everywhere. We don't say that this is going to work everywhere, but it's something that people should be aware of. And I think for some reason, a lot of people are not aware of this. 
And this is an aerial view of the plots. It's on oh, about three acres, I think. And there's different fertilizers are applied to the plots. And I've been fortunate to visit there many times at different times of the year. When I go to England, I usually try to stop by at Rothamsted. It's just north of London. And we can see that the fertilizers have a huge impact on what plants grow in, in the plots. Now, um, C.V. Piper, the first chairman of the USGA Green Section, wrote an article about this 89 years ago because, of course, the experiment at that time had been going on for 80 years or so. And uh, in the 1920s, he wrote an article in the Green Section record, and he listed a number of reasons why we need to be careful in extrapolating you know, the results because some of the plants that grow in England don't grow in the United States. Obviously, it's only for cool season grasses there. Um, these plots are harvested for hay, and it's not like it's not exactly a lawn. But the, he still said that he thinks that this, uh, the results of the park grass experiment, have a high amount of importance and relevance to to green keeping in the United States. And I think, I mean, certainly when I went there, I was absolutely shocked and stunned at how some of the plots look like a, a lawn and some of them just look like a bunch of weeds. So I've been there in the winter when it's, they mow it twice a year. So here this is in the winter time and it's been mowed in the autumn and so it all sort of looks like a lawn. And this is in the summer after it had been harvested and again at this point it will often look like a lawn. And I just want to show this particular plot. This is the one that receives ammonium sulfate. So it's been receiving ammonium sulfate for 157 years on this particular plot, a low rate of ammonium sulfate. So in the foreground, there's basically only three, there's three species that make up the bulk of the biomass. It's 65% uh, by weight will be Agrostis capillaris. It's about 30% by weight, Festuca rubra. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's 30% by weight, uh, uh, sweet vernal grass, Anthoxanthum odoratum, and the, then maybe about 5% Festuca rubra. Now, it, that same plot going back, we start to see the flowers from some, what we consider maybe a broadleaf weed, uh, various other things growing. That's where it still received only ammonium sulfate, but now lime has been applied. So the pH then goes to be about five, about six, and about seven going back in the background, and we can see much greater species diversity. So um, I, I think people should be aware of that. Sometimes people try to put potassium, and they try to make the grass healthy. They try to put lime, thinking well, let's get it at an optimum level and we'll be at pH 6.5 and then the grass is going to be healthy. Well, yeah, but you're also going to have more weeds potentially. And uh, John Foy wrote an excellent article about this in the Green Section Record last autumn called uh, Nutritionism, I think, where he's saying, you know, there's not a lot of science behind trying to apply lots of nutrients to make the grass healthier. And I think what we talk about today and about the results of these type of ecological experiments show that uh, giving just what the grass needs and no more is going to favor grass and, and not weeds. It's cool. They've got uh, soil samples. These samples were collected in 1876. Um, they've got oh, it's it's almost it's the size of a golf course maintenance building with uh, with with stack stacks um, shelves full of soil and plant tissue samples collected from this experiment over the past 150 years all the way up to the ceiling. It's, it's just amazing. Um, now, can we extrapolate that to warm season grasses? I, I mean, not necessarily, but I mean, not at all really. But the same principles are probably going to apply in that we can expect that if we apply different fertilizers, we're going to favor different species. And I grew different grasses in Thailand. This is at the Asian Turfgrass Center's research facility, uh, which we operated from 2006 until 2009. So three, three years of relatively high maintenance, one year of just letting it grow. 
We never applied any herbicides there. We, we had low nutrient levels. Uh, some of this is a sand capped root zone. Uh, we had pH in the foreground, the pH is 3.7. Uh, in the background, the pH was in the sixes, but it was on sand. The, the sodium levels in some sections were two or three times higher than the soil potassium levels. And still with the warm season grasses, we, we had uh, excellent condition if we put enough nitrogen. So that indicates that there was enough calcium, there was enough, the pH was high enough, there was enough potassium for us to have uh, good turf grass conditions. And I'll just show one more little cool picture. Um, this is at Takitomi Island in Japan. It's uh, near Taiwan. And this is Zoysia matrella, manila grass, forming a mono stand in just growing in the rocks beside the ocean. So again, the here we have grass growing. It's, it's a turf grass. It's not a weed. Obviously, there's no supplemental calcium applied, no supplemental potassium applied. It's, it's not, I mean, we don't ex directly extrapolate this to a, a golf course turf or a lawn turf situation. But again, we can see grasses and the grasses we use on uh, fine turf areas can often thrive in some pretty extreme environments. And I think it's important to consider the ecology as far as what, uh, where the grasses grow in the native environment and consider some of these ecological experiments about what effect of different nutrient levels have on, on, uh, on what species grow. So for me, these are kind of the talking points. I'm not saying that we can control uh, weeds by the fertilizers we apply. But I'm, what I do, do think is very important is every turf grass manager, every professional turf grass manager should be aware that the soil nutrient levels can have an effect on the species that grow and they should study that and, and pay attention to that. Um, at park grass, they, it started out as a, an experiment. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, That's good. You're up. Are, are we good? Yeah. So, um, what what I would just like to say real quick, and and then I'll open the discussion to everyone. But um, the the park grass experiment was started in 1856 and they wanted to study what the effect of different fertilizers on what the effect of different fertilizers was on hay yield and on the the quality of the hay and in the very first year they noticed uh, and they wrote this in in a publication that was published in 1860 I think um, it, it uh, they said the the plots looked not like they'd been applied with different fertilizers, but it looked like they'd been sowed with different seeds. And and so I I think that's important for people to know. That's and that's why I love to share that kind of stuff on Twitter and encourage people to think about what they're doing. All right. Yeah. Well that it does uh does cause some interesting thoughts to go around. Scott, do you want to uh, follow up with uh, some information there? Yeah, I'll, I'll share some stuff I put together in, um, and um, so we'll go to this screen share. There you go. Is it up? Yep. Okay. Um, so, let's see if it advances. Uh, is it advancing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is a presentation I put together a couple of years ago for um, G uh, GCSAA Answers on the Hour session, and I, I put some slides together. And just, um, you know, we, we had really been thinking about POA control is what, we, what we'd really been thinking about. And I went back, similar to what Micah did, and, and I went back and pulled a lot of uh, Howard Sprague's work um, in the, from the 1920s um, from the National Greenskeeper and some of the early stuff he had done. And what he, he had done this initial study where he looked at, uh, he was looking in bent grass and he's looking at, at POA control. 
I mean, he's looking at no fertility. He had a 510 uh, 5 fertilizer, uh, 2.8 pounds of N per thousand per year. Uh, he had a bone mill. The analysis was not reported. Typically, it's a, a full about a 412 0. Uh, po annual coverage after two years, two and a half years was 33, um, 32, and 37 percent, respectively. So I guess you all can read. Final uh, pH is 6.2, 6.4, and 6.6. Okay, you got that. Uh, and but then he had these other treatments where he actually um, he had ammonium sulfate uh, at same same rate of N. He had elemental sulfur. Uh, at 6.9 pounds per thousand plus uh, ammonium sulfate, elemental sulfur at an even higher rate uh, plus uh, ammonium sulfate, and his his pole annual coverage after that was um, 16, 20, and 6 percent. And you know, and the thing that comes out to me in this is this was 1929 when this was published, and there's a lot of people who are trying to sell these programs of uh, lower pH. Uh, lower nutrients today, and obviously this is something that's been known for a, a long time. This is not, um, and it's something that we're actually having to revisit in many ways due to um, possibly the, the expansion of turf grass throughout the world. Of course, there's uh, different pesticide restrictions, different pesticide restrictions now in the U.S. The desire to you know drop pesticide use. So, but you know there is some information out there. That we can really uh, base our, um, you know, going forward, base our uh, research off of. I was uh, talking with Larry yesterday. I like to read these in an old timey voice. It seems significant in these tests. Sorry, that was my old timey voice. So that was some humor interjecting. <laughs> these fertilizers, which contain uh, phosphates and potash in addition to nitrogen, have permitted the most abundant growth of Poa annua. Uh, but those that dis those who dislike the plant may discourage. I love that wording. May discourage it by making the soil strongly acid, and by withholding fertilizers containing phosphates and potash. Uh, and but here, here's his. So this is my schematic of if you want to control POA, you use nitrogen fertilizers at lower pH, you up the sulfur, and you drop the phosphorus. And there's other publications that you can go back to that that say a lot of what uh, Micah just said. You got to lower uh, potassium. Uh, rates as well if you want to get rid of POA. Uh, but uh, Dr. Sprague does, does uh, say this, uh, the advisability of uh, making the soil strongly acid and withholding fertilizers containing phosphates and potash is doubtful since the bent grass becomes less vigorous under such treatment. Now I think that gets to be uh, the point with trying to develop um, any type of fertility program fertilizer program that uh, tries to control uh, a weed species is that uh, you're constantly teetering on that edge of trying to maximize turf grass growth, turf grass health, turf grass vigor, and at the same time eliminating the weed species, especially something as difficult as, as poa annua. But obviously it's been done and it can be done, and obviously there's historical demonstrations as, as Micah just, just showed as well, but the whole problem for me is, for us in the southeast at least, we, we struggle to grow something like bent grass anyway, where you're in trying to manipulate any type of soil fertility in order to control POA um, is pushing uh, bent grass management even further than than we um, than we can really handle. So that's something I wanted to bring up. I may bring it back. Maybe we want to discuss a few things. I can skip some slides and show you some things further further on. I got a lot of educational points. Maybe I'll do that. And maybe we can discuss some things. So let me go back. Let's just I'm gonna show you. I'll show you some zinc sulfate work you may be interested in. So Beth Gertal and I did some work with an undergraduate student uh, looking at zinc sulfate. And basically what we saw is that you can, um, you can utilize zinc and it, can, it actually can control POA annua. And it, so here's a pH of 6.8 uh, looking at 
uh, poll annual germination, and you can see from these pictures, you have increasing rates of zinc, which was showed in this. We're up to 190 to 120 pounds of, of zinc per acre. And you can see those, what you get. So zinc is actually um, a topical control agent, or potentially could be. And that, that's one thing I would say about uh, using fertilizers. You have two methods of controlling weeds with fertilizers. You can change the, 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 the long-term uh, soil nutrient content, either up or down, and that's through manipulation over time. And, you know, that takes a long time. It, well, potentially it doesn't from what Michael presented, but, you know, it can begin to see changes almost immediately. But, you know, realistically, it's going to take a few years in order to change that um, soil nutrient content. And then, but then you also can have direct weed toxicity with um, a, a given fertilizer. And this is what zinc is, I think, is that you're actually getting direct toxicity from these applications. And we actually took this to the field, and I'll just skip to the pictures because they're a little bit better. Here's a, a Bermuda grass putting green in the winter that we utilize zinc as a more of a pre-emergent treatment. Here's uh, the non-treated. Here's 80 pounds of uh, zinc per acre applied as, as zinc sulfate. Here's 160 pounds of zinc per acre. And in this case, you see a little bit of phytotoxicity at the beginning uh, of the application. But after that, um, you know, it, the turf greens up fine. But, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's hard to recommend things like this because, uh, you know, I, I'm still a little fearful of the potential toxicity and, you know, growing a turf in a, a stressful environment and, you know, don't want to get anybody fired because I told them to apply too much zinc sulfate. That's a, that's a hefty rate of zinc. So, uh, you know, one, one thing I would say there are some precautions. We tried to do some studies. We uh, lowered the pH in Bermuda grass. You see, we had just verticut uh, the Bermuda grass in two directions, and we went out with a hefty rate of aluminum sulfate, and it fried it. I mean, it, it, was, it was brutal. And we... Um, so it was actually we actually we actually applied two times the rate of aluminum sulfate we actually needed. It was a miscalculation there. It happens, and uh, we really damaged that turf. And uh, so there are some precautions to, you know, trying to do things too quickly. I think it is more of a, a slow process. So, you know, if I if I looked at I didn't go over iron, but iron definitely is. Um, if you look at a lot of publications out there looking at. Uh, toxicity of, of iron to um, um, uh, poa annua specifically uh, and potentially it's tying up the phosphorus and decreasing phosphorus amounts so that, that's probably more so the, the new equation for poa control there is what I would say and I'll switch back stop sharing my screen and we can discuss my back yes all right yeah, yeah. that's my right. spiel yeah, well, so I saw the the two uh, kind of concepts of uh, I think Mike is working it from the uh, sort of withholding uh, until you get to uh, a level that is essential for the plant to uh, survive, which that sort of dials into some of the work that we had been doing with the minimum levels for sustainable nutrition for turf grasses. Just what's the minimum you need, and then Scott's talking about uh, you know some of the toxic side possibilities. Also, I don't know, Chris and uh, Matt, do you have any? Uh, comments or ideas on that type of a topic? Uh, it, it's sort of a lot of this stuff is what I got into doing when I was up at Northland and, and we had great success with it. I mean it's it's always there's some controversy to it because it's different but um, you know we had good results and I certainly would agree with what Scott said at the end in that you know anytime you're going to change to a alternative type program or something like that, you do need to take it slow. I didn't maybe do that as well as I could have, but uh, you can do some damage with it, and I think that's what scares people, but if you're careful and you, you do it properly and cautiously, I, I think it's there's some huge advantages. What what strategies were you implementing? The high iron? Mostly, yeah, high iron, yeah. And I mean, I, I sort of learned about the Greenway program. It wasn't I wasn't on their program. I didn't um, contract with them at all, but I learned about it and thought it sounded both interesting and effective and we found that to be the case. So, yeah, um, people who aren't familiar with it, there's a, you can 
check a link for Greenway and they have some information there and there's some uh, reports published and it, it uh, depends on the strategy of uh, dropping back total nutrition and, and increasing iron levels and trying to acidify the environment which it, in general uh, acidifying the soil environment means less stored nutrition uh, in the system. I think of that would that be right, Micah? Is, would you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, did you have anything that you? Yeah, I mean, I'm just uh, I'm always trying to balance. Um, I'll give you a quick brief history. It's kind of interesting to hear that uh, Rossi is really into this um, study on the English. Um, field since I worked with Frank on his uh, graduate work doing sweet vernal. I spent uh, many hours at URI uh, measuring and cutting roots for Frank on sweet vernal. So it was interesting to hear that uh, that Parkland has a, a whole bunch of uh, sweet vernal in it. But I'm always trying to balance the recommendations of academia versus real world. I'm at a nine hole golf course on a resort island doing a lot of rounds in a short amount of time. So um, it's not very easy for me to cut back fertility just because it's almost like a, well, it is a sports field, but when you think of it, it's, it's almost like a soccer pitch. Um, I'm just trying to keep grass on there, and for decades out here, I didn't care what it was. Uh, Poa, rye, fescue, uh, you know, the course is 77 years old this year, and so I've got a mixture of everything. And The environment I'm in, luckily, you know, we're not mowing at uh, 110. Uh, they're not looking for green speed. Uh, I'm the redheaded stepchild at Martha's Vineyard, so um, they're just happy to play, and um, it's just the way that it is. I try to balance, um, you know, environmentalism uh, with the practices. I treat my greens and my teas pretty much like everybody else does. My fairways and roughs are about as natural as you can be. I spray some herbicides. But I haven't sprayed a fungicide since 97. I've been using the BioJack strictly. Um, so, you know, we do some things progressive and some things, you know, kind of uh, normal. So it's just trying to learn what you can and, and uh, you know, match the balance and go from there. I will say it's getting hotter out here. And so I am working the last couple of seasons to try to convert the greens to bank grass. Um, but as Larry may remember, um, I do have saltwater intrusion as well. So um, Larry's email back to me was, uh, I believe it was the uh, sucks, mega sucks, and super sucks. And the sample I sent him, my water was in the super sucks variety. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like I said, I'm just happy when I have grass at this point. Um, you know, when you're pumping, uh, you know, 2,000, 2,500 parts per million of uh, seawater out there, I'd be happy if it was green clover. You know, so. Well, let me let me uh, let me show some other. Uh, let me just share a screen for some stuff that's not nutritional, maybe, but not from necessarily the uh, nutrients being uh, chemical nutrients. This this is a uh, this is Tory Pines when they're looking at removing ryegrass that uh, remained in shady areas on the sides of fairways, and they had sprayed revolver uh, along uh, uh, the side of the rough there so it gives you an idea what uh, what they were doing with that system so that was a that was not enough sunlight so that's this is a major factor and I know Mike is involved in that a lot looking at looking at sunlight conditions this is an interesting one this is ryegrass overseeded Bermuda and if you look a little closer these are uh, poa patches that have invaded uh, over top of the drain line so in this case uh, this is a, these are lower salinity areas. Uh, it's recycled water, and the salts got a little high, so that the the, uh, the po is only surviving over top of the drain lines, which is a was an annoying sort of a situation. So, but it does show the selection uh, that can happen depending on soil nutrient levels. In this case, there the uh, it, it's probably directly related to salt levels. But if you looked at total nutrition, it would be a lot more nutrients. In the areas surrounding where the uh, where the pole was located, so we have that type of situation. Let me see what was the last one I had here. Oh, it's just uh, these sorts of issues where we have uh, uh, you know clumpy ryegrass in uh, in Bermuda, trying to figure out how to get rid of those things are a major uh, issue that we're trying to uh, deal with. And then uh, in this 
this situation, this is just a downward looking aerial, uh, this is uh, rings of poa annua with some, uh, some clover and some uh, other weeds in the centers and uh, it's, this is most likely uh, just the irrigation distribution, there's probably a broken head. You see a couple of these, probably a back part of the head blew out and they're just dumping a lot of water so it's selecting it based on, the, I'm, I'm guessing uh, it's salinity issue. Again, I haven't tested the soils in these areas but there's uh, definitely the low nitrogen areas or there's some clover uh, coming in. Uh, so I don't know. It's a it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, system. There definitely is a lot going on with with soil nutrition, and it can happen pretty fast. So there's some opportunity to uh, to make some changes to to select for the right turf grass type. And I guess the question is which way to go. I mean, is it uh, should the effort be to reduce the inputs and see what happens, or do you try to uh, over apply certain uh, elements like uh, the Greenway program where you're you're trying to uh, well various nobody really knows exactly the mechanism of the way that's working right now uh, but I'm guessing uh, going along with Scott that the iron is tying up the phosphorus up in the surface and then the, the, the bank grass is being able to mine the phosphorus from deeper down in the profile I mean which is what would what, what's the take home uh, on uh, the observations that we see different uh, plants do better in different environments. Mike, maybe you got an idea on the ecology of the system. How can we take advantage of this to help the superintendents? Um, I, I, I'll just, I can't really answer that exactly, Larry, because I don't fully understand the question. But if we just talk just about nutrient levels, let me talk about the MLSN guidelines just a little bit and kind of try to tie this in with what we see at Park Grass and, and what. I would do if I were a turf, a, a turf manager or a golf course superintendent because I don't want to kill the grass either. I, I want to have good turf surfaces. Um, we've been working on the MLSN guidelines, which stands for Minimum Levels for Sustainable Nutrition, because I think, and I think Larry probably agrees, most of the soil nutrient uh, recommendations are just flat out wrong. So Larry, the Pace Turf old guideline for potassium was 120 parts per million in, in the soil with the Malik 3 extracted. The, the current MLSN guideline for potassium is 35 parts per million. And, and that is, what, about three times lower, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's significantly lower. We can find old research from California that suggests with ammonium acetate maybe 20 parts per million is a, is a good level. We can find research from Dr. Sartain in Florida for Tifway Bermuda grass using the Malik 1 extractant that says 30 parts per million is probably sufficient. Now why is it that the recommendations for potassium are so damn high? Penn State recommends for Malik 3 like 195 parts per million potassium for putting green turf. It's absolutely impossible to have it that high if you're in a sand root zone. And the, the recommendations are just wrong. So what's happening in reality is turf grass managers all around the world are trying to do what's normal, trying to do the right thing. And they so as far as they know, they're putting potassium and putting potassium. And I'm saying that it's likely, based on what we see at park grass, uh, at the, the results from the park grass experiment show, if you put lots of potassium, you get more weeds. If we look at uh, the research I did at Cornell, uh, shockingly, when we put more potassium on, on L93 creeping bent grass, we got more uh, gray snow mold uh, damage in the, in the winter. So there's, there's potential problems that can occur, and I'm saying people are inadvertently putting too much. Mike, I wonder how how that relates. Does that translate in the situation? We got I've got new USGA greens here. With I mean, obviously they're going to have some low CEC. They're immature soils. I mean, is that going to translate in that respect, or are we are we talking about more mature soils in 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 what you were just saying? Uh, as far as soil potassium levels go, uh, I'm confident that if you always keep this the the soil potassium in the root zone at or above 35 parts per million the the grass is going to have access to enough potassium and you will not 
have potassium deficiency problems or or any problem. So for me, I don't see any benefit to having uh, 50 parts per million, 75 parts per million, 100 parts per million potassium. Uh, if, if you just keep it at 35 mm -hmm. uh, or above, you'll be fine. Now, if you saw, I posted on my blog those waterfall charts that kind of show, you know, there's this much in the soil and then we, we have another bar that shows how much the plant may use and then we put another bar to show uh, approximately how much we put as fertilizer and how much is left at the end of the year. What you'll find with potassium is the grass takes up a lot of it. So we might take up the equivalent of, uh, in Minnesota, maybe you'd be taking up 50 parts per million per year. So if you start off the year at 35 parts per million, uh, you're going to have to apply quite a bit of potassium in order to keep the soil level constantly at or above the guideline level. But it's it's really easy to do a mass balance on this and just calculate it and it, and it works out really good. Now when you start applying significantly more than the soil can hold and significantly more than the grass can take up or the grass will use, all it's going to do is leach and that's wasted money and it's just wasted this pollution. Yeah, I think, and that's, and, and you balance it, uh, your recommendation, it's not a bad one either because uh, potassium moves so easily in the soil is that you fly the potassium uh, with the nitrogen is the easiest way to do it and you keep it in a uh, one to one, one to two, or two to one depending on which, whether your soils are low, medium, or high in, in uh, and potassium levels. Now, I guess let's get Scott. Do you have any uh, comments on what you think the take home is from what what you have uh, encountered looking at soil nutrition and soil fertility and, and weeds? Oh man, <laughs> um, I, I would say that um, you know I, I definitely take more of a, a weed science perspective on this than a soil fertility uh, fertilizer application perspective so and, and definitely when I look in the southeast um, and when you get into uh, these hot humid climates and we start trying to apply a lot of these findings here um, what, what we see is that all we do is shift from one species to the other uh, and that's it, when we start trying to manipulate fertility and I've always wondered if, if, and there's this, I saw this map uh, recently, and I, I, I can't remember where I saw it, but it was basically an image of the United States, and it had arrows going up and an arrow going down, and the transition zone kind of in the middle. And what they said in this map was, is that as you move further north, you uh, increase in disease pressure, and you decrease in weed pressure. And as you move further south, you decrease in disease pressure and you increase in weed pressure. And if you look at throughout the U.S., or at least on the east coast of the U.S., if you, if you look, you'll see the vast majority of the plant pathologists are transition zone north. And if you look at the vast majority of weed scientists, they're transition zone south who work in turf. And so for me, trying to apply these um, things to turf in the in the southeast has been very difficult we, again going back to this point of we simply just shift from one species to the other but this whole aspect of revisiting um, especially in, in a golf course is golf courses you can you can tightly manage these things and we have so much vast fertilizer fertilizer technology but revisiting this idea of what the actual recommendations should be is is, is really interesting to me because that um, really kind of totally changes the equation because you're, you're really dropping back on what the plant actually needs and possibly moving to more of uh, liquid fertilizer applications and uh, more spoon feeding you know I'm not <laughs> I don't love that term but uh, you know but that type of uh, scenario so that there's I, I think there's definitely room for improvement that's for sure, but my, my take home message is I, I think there's been a been much more research on cool season turf where there are fewer species you have to manage 
and the whole aspect of applying this to warm season turf, uh, more humid, uh, tropical, lots more rainfall environments is going to be harder. Especially if you go to California too. So that's mainly on the East Coast. You go to California, uh, you know, it's it's such a different environment. Uh, the in in the fact that you know, if, especially if you're coastal, you know, you may have very little temperature change throughout the season, or comparatively, at least to the continental. You know, as you move um, the continental effect as you move further inland. And, um, you know, so depending on what microclimate you're in, I mean, you may or may not have an application there. So I'll, I'll, those are my comments. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's well taken, I guess. And Micah, do you have a, a response? Yeah, on well, obviously, what, what happens in England uh, is not relevant in Florida and less, even less so in Bangkok or in, in Malaysia. But I think the principle is everybody should be aware that there can be shocking differences in what species grow in response to, to what nutrients are available in the soil and that doesn't matter if you're in northern Scotland or if you're in South Africa or if you're in Brazil. The, the, the nutrients that are available aren't going to have a, an effect on the species and Scott says it changes from one species to the next and that's the same thing at parkgrass uh, after about six it took about 40 to 60 years before it stabilized between uh, you know grasses dominating where the nitrogen was applied and legumes dominating where the the nitrogen was withheld and then even now uh, currently it, it it cycles within the grass species so one grass species will dominate for a while and and then another grass species will will dominate and and there's still you know where no fertilizer has been applied there's 35 species in a, in a very small plot um, yeah and I I would just say it's 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 fascinating there's about 20 I mean there's easily 20 articles on this that people can read and study and and then you can learn something that maybe can work in on the Monterey Peninsula or maybe it can work on Martha's Vineyard or maybe it's going to work well in in Minnesota and I would encourage professional turf managers to be aware of this to study it and not kill their grass but uh, you know test it. Pace Turf has some awesome documents on how to do on-site testing and uh, so where do you I, think I just, we should start, Micah, as far as if you were thinking about warm season turf grass, where, where do you think we should start as far as uh, research is concerned? Or as, as, if you were, you know, if you were th uh, talking to a superintendent in Florida, you know, and telling them, you know, you should consider this type of nutrient manipulation, you know, where would you start? Is it is it with the potassium like you're describing? Mm -hmm. I don't like to over apply anything because I don't like to waste money. I don't like to waste the time of my my crew. Uh, I don't like to waste my um, my mental energy being concerned about something that's not really a problem. So, I you know I, I don't want to over apply any fertilizers. I want to make that as simple as possible. Now, where to start? Uh, I think with warm season grass, there's the uh, mowing height and other cultural con other cultural factors are going to have more of an impact than nutrients probably would. Uh, I'm not a weed scientist by any means. Anything that I think that is a, a winter annual uh, and, and germinates from seed, I think we really want to look at phosphorus. Um, okay, so so I would start looking at the the main macronutrients and pH. So again, I mean you're looking the three elements are. Nitrogen's the most in the grass plant, then we have potassium, after that it's usually phosphorus and calcium. And calcium availability or amount in the soil is going to be quite correlated with uh, pH. So we start looking at those four things, nitrogen, phosphorus, but, uh, phosphorus is going to be really important for anything that grows from seed and uh, potassium and, and calcium and see what happens. I, I couldn't predict exactly what's going to happen with warm season but that's where I would start then you know they didn't expect this to happen with the cool season I mean this isn't something that was known by scientists 200 years ago they only figured it out 150 years ago and they didn't understand why and all the details I mean they're still learning about this so uh, with warm season grass something must happen but I don't know 
if it's effective. I don't know what exactly it would be. Hmm. Now, Scott, well, maybe there's going to be some um, some ability to get some funding for some of this work. We, I know that uh, we've been talking with uh, Brian Unruh in Florida because they're they're concerned about you know uh, groundwater contamination with nitrogen applications and trying to figure out how to time their nitrogen applications. I suspect that there's there's probably some water quality um, grants that might be available to sort of look at some of these ways of limiting that not necessarily t just targeting weed control but you know like your concern is you want to have a plant that's vigorous enough to recover and and provide a good enough playing surface so you got to kind of combine those things that's got to be the you know the, the it's got to be able to be a golf course otherwise it won't work but uh, it's, I think there just hasn't been that much uh, interest yet I mean, we haven't had that much trouble controlling uh, most of the weeds, and, and there hasn't been that much interest on uh, on reducing inputs in uh, in a lot of the funding that we you see coming in to uh, conduct research is going to be from the supplier's side. So it's not coming from the states anymore, and the public's not interested in it. So it's hard to find funding to do this type of research where you're just going to look at how do you figure out how to put less on. <laughs> it's not. It's just not one of those research projects that resonates within the industry very yeah. but you know for for the fertilizer industry in the US especially people who developed more liquid fertilizer applications I mean I, I think they would you know that they, they've they've increased the value of, of fertilizer and we, we're changing the way in which things are applied so if, if you're shifting more to a um, you know a fertilizer that has, has maybe you know a fourth less nitrogen but it costs twice as much you know um, and can you know can eat comes in a, a jug instead of comes in a bag you know that I mean there's I think there's possibility there for uh, from some companies you know who would be interested in, in it takes some convincing I think for them to see the value but you know I wouldn't discount that yeah yeah well, but, you know so a state like Florida too you know they're 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 really concerned with um, you know um, more so than I would say than some other states within the southeast about um, surface water groundwater contamination and, and the issues they've dealt with with atrazine and simazine and you know they're really concerned about uh, phosphorus and, and, and nitrogen as well so I, I would say that that Florida probably is more concerned about any than any other state in the southeast so well, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting topic. I think unless we don't have any other uh, comments, I think we're pretty well um, used up our hours worth of time. Do, uh, does anybody have anything else they want to get in before we go to the last round of uh, introductions and goodbye? Yeah, I just I think I kind of said this to Mike on Twitter yesterday. I mean, I think this is one of the most relevant. This park grass experiment is one of the most relevant studies to what we do that that might be out there. There's a lot of stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not discounting other things, but just the longevity of it and and what it's shown us, um, I think, has something to say about about what we're all doing. No doubt. So it's great. Yeah, I I I think it's fascinating, and I'm not saying we can control weeds by by applying that. I'm not saying it's relevant to Bangkok. Uh, I just I agree with Chris. It's it's fascinating and it's relevant in ways to just understand some of the big picture things uh, about growing plants. Yeah, I mean, I would agree that I think anything that shakes up the conventional norm, um, I mean, Arasi has essentially made a living at uh, trying to get us turf managers to think differently than we've been programmed to think, if you will. And it's all good. Um, I think as long as your intentions are good and as long as you're doing, you know, modified pace uh, test plots and not just spraying your whole golf course or changing whole scale issues, um, it's all good. And, and we should all be thinking the best ways we can to try to shake things up and do things differently that are all better for the environment. It's the way we're going and we have to get that way. It's a mindset. There's no question about it. All right, I guess that uh, does it. Why don't we just uh, introduce ourselves going across, and uh, if you have anything to promote while you're here, go ahead. And we want to also uh, thank John Kaminsky for having 
gotten all these things started up. He couldn't be here today because he's down in Myrtle Beach out in the field. He's trying to monitor on his cell phone, I think. Uh, and he uh, guided me through getting this uh, set up so we could have another uh, hangout, even though he's not in town. Uh, I certainly hope he comes back soon. Anyway. Wait, let, 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 let me. Did you say he was in Myrtle Beach working? Is that right? His, it's, it, it, you know. <laughs> I, yes, he's working. <laughs> yeah, he's got a picture. He's got a picture yeah, on Twitter. Did. It sure looks like. Almost golf. forgot where we were. <laughs> yes, John is working. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. He's working. got a he's got a golf glove on in this picture on Twitter. I think that's uh, okay. that's working. Good idea. <laughs> he said he was out in the field, which is, I guess is correct. Anyway, John. That kind of work pays our salary, Chris. So. No, no. I hey, I got nothing against it. I think it's great. <laughs> Okay, why don't we just go around from Chris, start off, and we'll just say our goodbyes. Yeah, Chris Trubba, sorry I had to I had to get out on the introduction, but I'm at Hazeltine, and, um, you know, we're going to uh, work to grow a lot of bent grass here. That's what they want. That's kind of why I was hired, so um, that's our goal for the year. And, and this sort of thing is all very interesting to me. Again, I've sort of worked with some of the philosophies that Scott talked about in his uh, – in his um, – presentation and and it it's it did well for us it it, it works and you got to be careful with it you got to do it right you got to really think but uh there's something to be had there uh again matt crowther mink meadows golf club i'm just here trying to learn um i'll put a plug in for uh umass and uh dr gunwa jung he's doing a study this summer on my golf course with one of his grad students where we're going to be pulling soil samples from um, Vineyard Golf Club, which is 100% organically maintained, and then several different places of mine, because I'm kind of a hybrid, and we're testing um, soil bacteria to see if there's a difference in conventionally maintained versus uh, organically maintained uh, for bacteria counts. Never been done in turf, it's been done in potatoes, I understand. So I'll be curious to see, you know, whether uh, there's a difference between my approaches, which I use uh, traditional fungicides on, and my fairways, which I don't, versus 100% organic. So that sounds that sounds very interesting. I'll be uh, watching those results closely when they come out. <clears throat> I'm Michael Woods, chief scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. And on this topic and other things related to uh, soil nutrition and uh, nutrient availability to turf grass, I will often tweet about it. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Asian Turf Grass. Uh, and my blog is uh, blog.asianturfgrass.com. So I always write about these kind of things. Um, and I'd like to thank Scott for uh, taking such an interest in this and, and spurring us to have this conversation and I would not be surprised if we talk about a very similar topic on a future turf chat because I think some follow-up questions will come out of this. Thank you. And Scott McElroy at Auburn University and um, I, one thing that I, I, I would finish up on last comment was is that I'm, I'm doing a lot of research dealing with herbicide resistance and we're seeing herbicide resistant populations uh, poa annua to just about every herbicide out there and uh, the ability of poa to adapt to uh, herbicide applications environmental stress is uh, phenomenal and uh, one of the things that you know I, I think uh, we're kind of I'm kind of on the lookout right now is to look in to see if I'm finding uh, poa populations in uh, soil stressed environments actually going down to the coast and trying to collect plant populations and things like that so uh, in, in more saline environments so I wonder in this whole process are weeds just simply going to adapt and of course I take a much more weed science approach to this perspective that'd be my last comment and uh, pass it off to Larry all right. Well, thank, thank you all for being here. I thought I just, uh, because someone did mention that uh, John was watching from the field, he did tweet a, uh, a shot of uh, where he was at. So there. <laughs> uh, we'll leave it off with uh, John and uh, appreciate you all for uh, attending and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh,
do this again and uh, pursue this topic a little bit further. Thank you very much. Right. And yeah, thanks, Larry. Bye, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Nice job. Bye, bye.